Time now for Inside Utah Politics. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Glenn Mills. It is time to go Inside Utah Politics. And we do begin this morning with Lieutenant Governor Deidre Henderson. Lieutenant Governor, great to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Glenn. It's great to be here with you. A uh, lot to get into today. Uh, we'll see how much we can get into, but let's start off with the coronavirus response. Uh, we know things are changing, things are turning around, no doubt about that, but where do we go from here? Well, right now we've got to get people vaccinated. Our goal is to have 70% of the state of Utah uh, eligible people vaccinated by, uh, by the 4th of July. We're, we're falling short right now uh, and, and, we, and we're hoping to be able to, to really push and, and do better uh, and, and get across that finish line. Um, it's really important for people to get vaccinated who, who want it and who have, just haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, but for some reason, you know, it's, it's slowed down significantly. Mm -hmm. Let, let's dig into that goal a little bit more. Last I saw, we were sitting somewhere around 63%. So seven more percent within the next couple of weeks. Is that going to happen? And if not, what does that mean? Well, in order for us to reach that goal, we really need to do about 12 and a half thousand prime doses per day. Um, and, and that's about four times more than, than what we're doing right now. Now, we're doing a little bit better this past week. Uh, we're seeing a bit of an uptick, which is good. Um, but man, we, we've got a lot, uh, a long way to go. We're calling on businesses to, to step up, faith groups um, to, to uh, put together pop-up clinics mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, get their employees and, and the people that belong to their organizations vaccinated. So is this more of a matter at this point of people who are just not going to do it or is it a matter of still getting people who just simply haven't had the access to get it that are still willing? We know there is around 20% or so of people who just aren't going to get it. And, that, and that's, that's their choice and we're never going to force people to get it. Um, but there are a number of people who are on the fence for whatever reason, they're probably going to get it or it hasn't been convenient for them. Uh, it, you know, they, they're worried about the symptoms or, you know, taking time off work or, or things like that. And so we're really hoping to, to get to those people who are going to get it, are, are, are willing to get it, are, are able to get it, but just haven't done it mm. yet. Are, are you confident we're going to reach herd immunity uh, between even a mix of maybe those that don't get the uh, vaccine and who have had it and may have natural antibodies and those who have got the vaccine? Well, the problem is we just don't know what that natural antibody bit looks like, really. Um, it, we don't know how long it lasts. We don't know how good it is compared to actually getting the vaccine. It's much better to get the vaccine, even if you have had coronavirus like I have. Um, it's best to get the vaccine. And, and part of the reason is because we're seeing variants take hold. And, and the faster people get vaccinated, the slower those variants can take hold in our population. And, and we're really worried about these variants. They, they are more transmissible. Um, and these vaccines actually are very, very effective against preventing severe disease with these variants. Okay, we are coming close to that uh, July 4th uh, deadline. We'll keep an eye on how that goes. Let's move on to another initiative you have recently launched, a very interesting one, the Returnship Program. Start off by defining the Returnship Program. What is it? Well, a returnship is for, unlike an internship that's meant for people at the beginning of their careers, um, a returnship is really meant for people who have been out of the workforce for a long period of time and are looking to get experience and get back into the workforce without starting at the very bottom of the career ladder. Um, people need, you know, they maybe have gaps in their resume and need some relevant uh, and, and meaningful experience or even reskilling or upskilling in order to, to get a, a meaningful job. And so the returnship program is meant to focus on those people and really kind of uh, net them back into the workforce. Mm -hmm. And what type of a response are you seeing? seeing a really positive response. Uh, th we're the first state in the nation to, to launch uh, such a program. There are companies throughout the nation that have uh, initiated their own returnship programs, and we're looking at those and, and modeling ours after, after those. But uh, really here in the state of Utah, we've got two tracks. We've got the education path, people who need to go back to school, mm -hmm. need to get uh, you know, upskilled or reskilled. And then we've got the, the state agency track, uh, for people who just need some meaningful experience to, to add to their resume to help them get a foot in the door. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That, that was the bill sponsored by Representative Lowry Snow. He was on the show talking about that, helping those who have maybe had some college and not able to get it done, be able to get back to school. Why the focus on this particular demographic? 
Well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, opportunity is something that's very important to me. It's very important to, the, to Governor Cox. Um, opportunity and equality is really one of the six pillars of our administration. Um, but also, we're seeing a really tight labor market right now, and we've got to re-engage people who want to be re-engaged. One of the things I'm hearing from business owners throughout the state is the difficulty that they have in finding people to even apply for the jobs that they have available. So we've got to we've got to engage new people into the into the labor market and. This is one way to help do that. Mm -hmm. and, and you could say this is personal for you because you've been on that road before. I have. Um, I have. I, I was a stay-at-home mom for 13 years, um, and, and really it wasn't a a, a formal returnship program, but I did uh, get my start in, in politics and in the workforce by just, you know, having an opportunity to work on a campaign, to, to make phone calls, um, and, and really that one thing led to another. Um, also, my chief of staff, uh, she she called me a few years ago and said, hey, I, I, I'd like to come and, and intern for you during the upcoming legislative session. I said, you know, I actually already have an intern. I, I don't really need one, but thanks anyway. And, and she said, look, Deidre, I, I just got a divorce. I need experience. I'm trying to get back into the labor market. And so I said, you know what? Come and intern for mm -hmm. me. And so, you know, we really started that a long time ago. And one thing led to another with her, and now she's my chief of staff. Okay. Uh, so you can see success right in that uh, story there. Uh, another thing I want to get on uh, the discussion with you is the role that you are uh, taking right now as lieutenant governor. Uh, I don't want to say that the lieutenant governor was an obscure position in the past, but certainly more behind the scenes, maybe not as visible would be more appropriate. What do you make of this evolving role that you find yourself in now? Well, I, I think it is what, what we make it. The lieutenant governor has some very defined um, objectives and, and um, uh, duties and responsibilities outlined in statute and, and in uh, our state constitution. Uh, but one of the biggest things that the lieutenant governor is supposed to do is whatever the governor asks the lieutenant governor to do. And so, um, you know, then Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox, uh, last year when he asked me to be his running mate, he made it very clear that he valued my experience in the Utah State Senate. He valued me as a person and he wanted me to be a partner with him um, and, and really would rely heavily on me uh, and my experience with the legislature, my experience with policy. And, and so it's been a really great partnership that way. Um, also, I think, you know, he, he did elevate that position as, as Lieutenant Governor himself, but mm -hmm. I think part of it is uh, maybe social media. Uh, people have better access uh, to, to what we're doing and, and how we're doing it now than maybe they did in, in, in previous years. Uh, okay, yeah, that, that, that's a good point, something I, I didn't consider. But definitely we did see that uh, evolution happen when he was the lieutenant governor as well. But what does it mean to you to be included in that way? Because I see you traveling with the governor all the time, uh, you know, bill signings with the governor, and, and he has definitely made it a point to make sure everyone knows you are part of the team and the administration. What does that mean to you? Well, it means a lot to me. Uh, I was up for re-election in my third term in the Utah Senate last year when he asked me to join him, and I had to make a choice. I had to choose uh, for, to have an easy re-election to my third term or, or to take a chance um, with, with Spencer Cox. And, and uh, you know, ultimately I, I chose to, to take a chance with him because uh, he made it very clear that he, he valued my input and, and it wasn't going to be a, a, you know, a ribbon cutting position only, uh, so to speak. And, and he's really worked hard uh, to make sure that I am included. And, and it's, been a, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, nobody teaches you how to be a lieutenant governor, so it's mm -hmm. something that I'm figuring out every day. Yeah, and when you talk about that risk, that was a very close primary that uh, you and the governor were locked in to get to the point where you are now. Uh, really appreciate your perspective and your time this morning. Thanks so much for uh, making time for us. Thanks, Glenn.